Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today uh, is the Day of Atonement. It's the Sabbath of Sabbaths, and we'll call our assembly together by the blowing of the shofar. <laughs> Okay. So let's go to Yahoo in prayer and ask him to bless this time for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do and the many blessings that you give us. Father, today on this day, we observe the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Father, we ask that you just give us the wisdom of how we are supposed to conduct ourselves during this day. I know there's confusion around. Everybody's got their own ideas of how things need to be done today. But Father, we just ask that you help give us the wisdom, give us the knowledge, the understanding, and help us to be what you call us to be. Help us to... to Help this day be a pleasing aroma to you. And Father, we just, we praise you and we thank you. And we just ask that you watch over God and direct us. Father, be here with us this, this day. And uh, we'll give you the praise and the glory. For it's in Yahushua's name we pray. Amen. So today, again, is the Day of Atonement. And I know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of teaching out there on how we are to actually supposed to be conducting ourselves today. And, uh, you know, I think all of it's pretty valid in what they're saying. And, but the thing is, it, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, that a lot of the teaching is exactly the way you would like us to, to do and to, do, to be on today. And so uh, I guess let's, let's just go to the scripture and look at it right quick and we'll start, we'll start from there. Let's go to Leviticus 23 and look at the Day of Atonement, starting in verse 26. <clears throat> okay, and it says, Again, Yahuwah said to Moses, The tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. Okay, so today, the calendar that we use is an observed calendar. In other words, it's the calendar that, that when the sliver of the moon is sighted in Israel, then uh, we get word that the, that the moon has been spotted, meaning that it's the first day of the month. Okay, so that being our calendar and the one that I think lines up with the scripture, then, uh, you know, today will be the 10th day of the month. So now I know on the Hallel calendar, which is not an observed calendar, it's a calendar that, that is calculated and they can, you know, I've got a book that actually give, gives 150 years of the, the Hillel calendar. Well, if it's, if it's a 150 year calendar, it's not observed. In other words, the moon isn't observed. It's just calculated. Well, it's, it was two days before today. And so, you know, which calendar is right? I've got my own ideas and I think the one that we're doing is the correct one. But if you're on a different calendar, well, you know, that's, that's completely up to you. And that's between you and Yahuwah. But uh, today is the seventh, uh, I'm sorry, the 10th day of the seventh month on the calendar that we observe. It says, you shall hold a sacred assembly. Okay, that's what we're doing right now. We're starting, we're having our sacred assembly and you are to humble yourselves. Now here's where it gets cloudy. The word humble yourselves in, you know, in all the, the teachings that you listen to, it, it means to fast. Well, the word fast in Hebrew is the word psalm. And it's, it's almost like it's a, a T-S-O-M is kind of how it's, how I would spell it, but it's pronounced psalm. Well, in other places in the scripture, it has no problem saying, calling it a psalm, a fast, but here it doesn't do that. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't fast. Don't get me wrong in this, but it just doesn't say that you are to fast. Okay. It just said you are to humble yourself. Now the humble, if, if that word, that Hebrew word is enough. Now the, the word yourself there is nefesh. Okay. It's, so what it says is you're to hold a sacred assembly. And in the Hebrew, it says to 
uh, ana nefesh. Okay, ana means to humble. Nefesh is your spirit. So what it's saying is you, to, you are to afflict or to humble your spirit. Now, a fast is more the humbling of the flesh, not the spirit. Now, it can be a humbling of the spirit also. But it, you know, a fast would be one way to annah your nefesh, your, your spirit. But I don't know that that's exactly what it's actually meant right here. So, and we'll get into some of that in just a minute. And it says, and to present an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. So this offering made by fire is our obedience to the scripture. So in other words, you know, our obedience is representative of the oil. The oil is lit in the menorah causing the fire. The fire is our, is, you know, our, our fire is our witness to the people out in the world. Okay. That's, that's our, uh, that, that's our fire, you know, our, uh, Shekinah of glory, I guess, if you will. Okay. Now, the back to the humble yourself. Uh, we know that during this time of atonement, that Yahushua was crucified on the cross. And he atoned for all of our sins. Okay. So the atonement has already been done. And what we're doing is we're doing it in memory or memorial to what you know, Yahushua has already done. And so uh, if you go back and do more study on it, it says you're to continue this throughout all your generations forever. So we are doing this because the scripture tells us to do it. And we are doing this in honor of what Yahushua has done. He has, he, he has uh, atoned for our sins. Now, the thing about the atonement is it's the debt has been paid, but we don't actually get canceled until the judgment. See, the judgment is when everything is settled. That's when all accounts are settled. That's when all debt is paid. That's when everything from Yahuwah's standpoint is completed. So after the judgment, then we will have salvation. Now we, we work or we, we strive we live our daily lives for that salvation. And like Paul says, you know, we are to work out our own salvation. Well, so we are working it out, but it's not granted completely until the judgment. And we haven't been judged yet. So just keep all that in mind. It says, on this day, you are to do uh, not to do any work, for it is a day of atonement. When you, when atonement is made for you before you hear your all hand. If anyone does not humble himself, and that's the word again there is anah, if anyone does not humble himself on this day, he must be cut off from his people. I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on this day. You're not to do any work at all. This is a permanent statute for the generations to come, wherever you live. It will be a Sabbath of complete rest for you, and you shall humble yourselves from the evening of the ninth day of the month until the following evening, you are to keep your Sabbath. Okay, so on this particular day, we're supposed to not do any work. Now, keep in mind that from a prophetic standpoint, the Day of Atonement is the wedding day. So us being the bride, you wouldn't, a bride wouldn't work on her wedding day. She's preparing to be wed that day. So she wouldn't actually do the, you know, any work. That's the picture that, that, that we're, you know, that we're painted here that it's painted for us to see is that, you know, this is, this is the wedding day. The, we had the feast of trumpets on the first day of the seventh month. And that was the announcement that the wedding's fixing to happen. This day of atonement is the day that Mashiach is going to take his bride. That's why you know, you don't want to be working. You don't, you want to be clean. You got to be clean the day before on the evening, the day before to be clean today. If you're, if you're defiled after evening on the, the, the day of the ninth, then you will be defiled on the 10th day of the month. Okay. According to Torah. So, uh, today is the, is the prophetic wedding day. 
And then in four days is the honeymoon takes place, and that's the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so we we start Tabernacles in uh, on the fourteenth day of the or the fifteenth day of the month. I'm sorry, and uh, so now we're in the Day of Atonement. So it's vitally important. This day is vitally important that we humble ourselves before Yahuwah. Now, how do you do that? I guess it's kind of a rhetorical type question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do the best that I can to try to answer. You know, what 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 are you supposed to do on the Day of Atonement? And this is something that I think Scripture's shown me. And if Scripture showed me this, then I know that the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, has showed me this. So if you read in uh, Deuteronomy 16 and where it's talking about Passover, it's talking about the unleavened bread being the bread of affliction. Okay, that affliction, again, is anah. So the bread of affliction that it's talking about in Deuteronomy 16 is, uh, I'm sorry, it's in it's, no, it, it's either Leviticus or Deuteronomy. I think it may be Leviticus 16. But anyway, in either case, uh, it talks about the bread of affliction. And so the bread of affliction we know is representative of that unleavened bread being Yahusha, the Messiah, and him being without sin, and him being unleavened, him being without leaven. And so that if, if we look at this from afflicting our souls, we are going through a type of a fast today. Okay, so we're not eating anything except unleavened bread. And we'll use, we'll use the unleavened bread and we'll dip it in olive oil, which is representative of our obedience which in, in the olive oil, we're going to have some bitter herbs. We're going to have, there's some garlic, there's some salt, which represents our tears. The, there's garlic, there's uh, uh, some uh, oregano and parsley and things like that, which are considered bitter herbs. Okay, so we're going to be dipping our unleavened bread in that and eating that in remembrance of what Yahusha has done on the cross so and then also we're going to be drinking wine and we also have grape juice and we have water and so we know that the wine and the the grape juice the wine is representative of the blood that was shed by Yahusha to atone for our sins and to cover our sins to do away with them and then the water we know is the, the it's representative of the living water which is Yahusha and out of our mouth will flow rivers of living water and that living water is our uh, witness for Yahusha so those that are that are that that keep the commandments of Yahuwah and have the faith in Yahusha the Messiah then you know those are the ones that are going to be keeping the day of atonement today and uh, or or be observing day of atonement because it's it's one of the most important days from our standpoint, from people's standpoint that there is, because this is the day that we are forgiven, that we will attain the eternal life and be united to Mashiach for eternity. So anyway, long story short, today is a very sacred day in, uh, you know, in our hearts and our lives. Now, next week when we have, uh, tabernacles then the wedding the prophetic wedding will already have taken place and this is the honeymoon phase so uh we'll uh we'll do a study on on tabernacles i guess next week and we'll post it on the internet and then uh, that way you know we'll just kind of keep up with these feast days like that okay so that's the day of atonement now i want to move on in to uh john and continue in the book of john and so we'll, we'll look at this because some of this stuff in John is also, it, it's parallel with what we're going through today because it, it's, it's roughly the same, roughly the same time frame. That Yahusha is, uh, let's see, I think we've gone through six, hadn't we? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, I believe that's right. And we're in John chapter seven. Okay, so we know that uh, 
Okay, so we here in John, they've observed observed Passover early in the in the study in, in chapters one and two in that time frame. And then uh, we had Shavuot. And then last week, there was a scripture in uh, chapter six that talked about Passover again, which we know was an added scripture and it's not in the timeline. So you can disregard that particular, that, those, that verse talking about it being Passover. Because here we're fixing to talk about uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is back in line with where we have been studying. So you have Passover, then you have Shavuot, and here we are now at, uh, at you know, fixing to go into Tabernacles. Okay, and, okay, so let's just go ahead and start the scripture. It says, after this, Yahushua traveled to Galilee. He did not want to travel to Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. However, the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near. All right, now, so here we are. The, it says that tabernacles is near. So it hadn't said anything about the Day of Atonement. And so we know that it's probably either before, right before atonement or right after the Day of Atonement. But it says that the Feast of Tabernacles is near. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is another pilgrimage feast where the people were required to go to Jerusalem. Okay, so here we are back at the Feast of Tabernacles. So Yahushua, uh, his, his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples there will see the works that you're doing. For no one wants to be known public to, to be known publicly acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Now, one of the things that they're they're talking about him showing himself to the world and making himself known. Well, he he's not doing that now because it's not his time. His time to show himself or to, to actually be known is going to be closer to Passover, which is six or eight months, you know, six months or so from this particular time. It says, it says therefore, Yahushua told them, although your time is always at hand, my time has not yet come. Okay, he's telling them that his time to, to, to let people really know who he is and for him to come out and and, you know, be out front is his time. It just it hadn't come yet. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. Go up to the feast on your own. I'm not going up to the feast because my time has not yet come. Okay, now keep this in mind. too. What we see in the scripture, it sounds like he's not going to the feast. But basically, he didn't say that he wasn't going to the feast. He said he wasn't going with them. Okay, so they're going to go on ahead of him. He's going to go to the feast. He will go. If he didn't go, then he would be in violation of Torah because all men were required to go to Jerusalem at this particular time, all right? So we know that he didn't violate Torah, so we know that he did go anyway. It says, having, this, having said this, Yahushua remained in Galilee, but after his brothers had gone to the feast, he also went, not publicly, but in secret. So the Jews were looking for him at the feast and asking, where is he? Many in the crowds were whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. But others replied, no, he deceives the people. Yet no one speaks publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Now, there's a lot of Jews, a lot of the people of this day know who he is. And so when he, when he teaches, there's just Huge crowds flock around him. Everybody, a lot of the, the common everyday people knew who he was. And so the, the hierarchy of the rabbinical Judaism here, they're the ones that were actually after him and trying to kill him. It was the, uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, scribes, those guys, because he was threatening their jobs. Uh, because, you know, he called them a brood of vipers because they were... Uh, they're teaching things that's not in the Torah, not in the scripture. And the things that they were teaching, they weren't doing themselves. <clears throat> so uh, it, let's see. Uh, I think it's in 14. Okay, about halfway through the feast, Yahushua went up to the temple courts and began to teach. And the Jews were amazed and asked, how did, did this man attain such learning without having studied? And what they don't realize is he may not have went to seminary, but he was taught by the, by the 
the the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit, the 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 teacher of all teachers. Now, you know, when when talking to people, especially trained theologians, you know, us that have not been to seminary, they look down at us as not knowing what we're talking about. But the fact of the matter is they're the ones that don't know what they're talking about in most cases. And the ones that are taught by the Ruach do know what they're talking about. And so this is a, the, the, Yahusha is in the same situation that we see ourselves in a lot of times. Because when we try to talk to people that have actually been through seminary, then they, they, you know, they just look at you and think, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. And they discredit what you're trying to say. When the fact of the matter is, is they're the ones that generally don't know. They're the ones that's out teaching people that the law has been done away with, that, uh, that we don't have to follow the Torah. And, and, you know, so they're the ones that don't know what, what's going on. Okay, in 16, it says, my teaching is not my own, okay, just like our teaching is not our own. It, it, it's coming from the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. Yahushua replied, it comes from him who sent me. If anyone desires to do his will, he will know whether I'm, my teaching is from Elohim or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. In him, there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps it. Why are you trying to kill me? Now, what they see, he's teaching what Moses taught. So, you know, they're not following what Moses said. And therefore, they're not following what Yahushua is trying to tell them to do. And he's telling them, well, you know, if you really believe what Moses taught, then why are you trying to kill me? Because Moses taught about me, talking about Yahushua. And so they didn't get it. They, just, they didn't understand. And then one of them, or they come up and they say, you have a demon, the crowd replied. Who is trying to kill you? Now, they're saying, you know, they're saying one thing that they're not, maybe not trying to kill him, not yet, but they really are. They're, they are, they're trying not, not, maybe not from a physical stance yet, but from a spiritual stance, they are trying to kill him because spiritually to kill someone spiritually is to not have anything to do with them, to just treat them as if they were dead. And so it's like how we're supposed to treat a modern day witch. It says, the scripture tells us don't have, you know, don't allow a witch to live. Well, if, you know, if, if we follow the scripture, then, then, you know, we go out and stone them. But today, the spiritual sense of, of not allowing a witch to live is just not having anything to do with them. Stay away from them. Okay. So uh, from a spiritual stance, they are trying to kill him. And also, uh, it, they, they said that he had a demon. Now, one of the things that's very vital that we understand in this particular uh, passage right here, if you go to, I believe it's Mark chapter three, one of the things that, that happened there is uh, this, somebody was caught, somebody said that somebody had a demon that had a devil. And it goes on to say that uh, that was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So there's a definition there. It's in, it's in Mark chapter three. It's either Mark or Luke, but I think it's Mark chapter three. I'll tell you what, let's just go there. Mate, let's, let's nail this down so we see it. Uh, my computer's acting a little slow right now, and I don't know. Let's see. Is it Mark? Let's check that. Okay, I believe maybe it's Luke. I get these mixed up occasionally. Sorry for the the time. All 
I don't know. Maybe I missed it in Mark, but it's in it's either Mark or Luke. I should have wrote it down. Bless me of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but, Let's see. Okay, the unpardonable sin right here. It's in, uh, it's in Mark chapter three, starting in 28. It's truly, I tell you, the sons of men will be forgiven all sins and blasphemies, as many as they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, Okay, Yahushua made this statement because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Okay, so here, what they've done is they said that he had an unclean spirit. He had a devil or a demon. And so that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if, if somebody is, has the, the, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kodesh, and someone else says that they have a devil or a demon or an unclean spirit, that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because what you're basically doing is saying that the, that the Ruach Kodesh is a liar. Okay, so calling Yahuwah a liar or calling the spirit a liar is blasphemy also. Because that's what they're doing here. They're saying, they're saying you know, what he's talking about. They don't believe. And they say that he has an unclean spirit, meaning that he's a liar. Okay, so he's calling the Ruach Kodesh. He's calling the Ruach Kodesh a liar. Okay, so let's go back to John and okay, so in verse 20, it says that they're accusing him. They said that you have a demon. Well, what they don't realize is he doesn't have a demon. He has the Holy Spirit and they just call the Holy Spirit a demon. So the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kodesh, is what they just committed. They just they just violated the unpardonable sin. Okay, then 21. Yahushua answered them, I did one miracle and you were all amazed. But because Moses gave you circumcision, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. And not that it is from Moses, but from the patriarchs. Okay, so it's actually, well, okay, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses will not be broken. Why are you angry with me for making a whole man well on the Sabbath? Stop judging by outward appearances and start judging justly. Okay, so what he's talking about is if a, if a male child is born, he's circumcised on the eighth day, according to Torah. Well, if the eighth day falls on the Sabbath, then they circumcise him on the Sabbath. Well, if, if that's okay, <clears throat> and evidently it is because they do it, then him, Yahushua, healing somebody on the Sabbath is also okay, all right? And it's understanding the principle of the Torah, the, the principle of the scripture, okay? So that's where people a lot of times run astray. They, they don't understand the, the, the principle of the Torah with Yahushua added to it. In other words, so it's, if you follow the strict letter of the law, then if a boy is born and he's in uh, and his eighth day is on the Sabbath, then the, the, the Torah says that you have to circumcise him on the eighth day, but yet to do that work on the Sabbath is a violation of Torah. So you're caught in a, in a situation where you're going to violate Torah either way. Well, Yahushua said that, that you know, you're, you're looking at it wrong because to heal somebody or to, to, to do what the scripture says do, to, you know, to do what's right and good is also good on the Sabbath. What he's talking about as far as working on the Sabbath is you don't go to your normal job. You don't go and try to, you know, you don't go out and try to earn money on the Sabbath, or you don't go out and try to, to do things on the Sabbath that can be done on a different day. But if you're, if you're, if you're supposed to circumcise a son on the eighth day and it falls on the Sabbath, then circumcise your son on the Sabbath. Okay. 
And and that's what Yahushua is trying to explain to these people. But in a lot of cases, all they're trying to do here is they're trying to trip him up and they're trying to make him say something or do something that they think is going to violate the Torah. Verse 25, it says, then some of the people of Jerusalem began to say, isn't this man they are trying, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Yet here he is speaking publicly and they were not saying anything to him. Have the rulers truly recognized that this is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When, when the Messiah comes, no man will know where he's from. Now, see, what they don't realize is he, yeah, they know where his body was from. They know that he was born in Bethlehem and he's, they know that, you know, that that's where he's actually from, but they don't realize that he is from Yahuwah. So, you know, he is there, he is actually from above, which is in heaven with Yahuwah. Then Yahusha, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, you know me and you know where I'm from. I have not come on my own accord, but he who sent me is true. Do you not know him? But I know him, or you do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. So, you know, here, that's what he's saying, that he is from Yahuwah. So they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Many in the crowd, however, believed in him and said, when Messiah comes, he will perform more signs than this man. When the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering these things about Yahushua, they and the chief priests sent officers to arrest him. So Yahushua said, I am with you only a little while longer, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. At this time, the Jews said to one another, where does he intend to go that he, we will not find him? Will he go where the Jews are dispersed among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Now, I just want to bring this out right quick. There's people looking for him every day and don't find him even though they read about him in the scripture and they say that they love JC and, and all this, they have not found him. He has gone to a place that they cannot find him. We have found him. We know who he is. We know that he is the living Torah, that he is the, the, the word of Yahuwah. And that word was made flesh. Him being the word, the living Torah, if you don't follow or understand or uh, acknowledge the Torah, then you don't acknowledge, you don't follow or know him. Scripture is very clear about that. But yet people are out there that will tell you that the Torah has been nailed to the cross. The law has been nailed to the cross. You don't have to do it anymore. Well, that flies in the face of what he's saying right here. You, if you don't know him, if you, if you can be looking for him and never find him, because if you don't know the Torah, you don't know him. Okay. Now, so that's, that's what he's saying. It's where, where I am. You cannot come. You can't come there because, you know, in your heart, you don't want to follow the Torah. You can't follow him where he goes if you're not doing what he says to do. It says, on the last great day of the feast, Yahushua stood up and called out in a loud voice. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. He was speaking about the spirit uh, whom, whom those who believed in him were later to receive for the spirit had not yet been given because Yahushua had not yet been glorified. Now, I want to go back up to the beginning of this. It says in 37, it says on the last and greatest day of the feast. Now, we know that from prophetic standpoint that the end times, the very end is going to be the wedding and the honeymoon. That's going to be the very end of time as we know it. And then New Jerusalem is going to be coming down and we're all going to go into New Jerusalem. Now, the time that's, that's representative of that period 
when New Jerusalem comes down and we all go into New Jerusalem and live in, in you know, in, in the, the perfect age with Yahuwah and, and all that it's perfect, that is the, the, the last or the eighth last great day is the representative of that time. Now, we were, you know, here, like today, we're in uh, uh, Yom Kippur. In what, five days, we'll be going, we'll be starting Sukkot, which is the honeymoon. And then Sukkot is seven days. But we observe eight days. And that eighth day is the last great day. And the eighth day is representative of that period of time. Okay, when Yahuwah created everything that there is. He created it in six days and he rested on the seventh. So there's seven days that we look at as being, there's a seven day uh, rotation, reputation that keeps going over and over and over. Okay, the eighth day is not called out as being one of the days of creation because the eighth day is after all is done, the eighth day is the final day. That final day lasts forever. It's an eternity day. And so the, the eighth day of Sukkot, which is the last great day, is representative of that eternal time frame where the bride, the Messiah, and all that have been saved through the tribulation and everybody that's, that's saved will go into New Jerusalem and live forever. So the eighth great day, or the last great day, the eighth day, right after the seven days of Sukkot, that's what that's representative of. Okay, then it says that, uh, that those that, that drink of the water that Yahusha has, it says out of them will flow streams of living water. And this is speaking about the spirit. The, so when, when we speak to, to people, when we talk to people about Yahuwah, the spirit, our breath comes out, carrying the words of Yahuwah. And those words are like springs of living water because those springs of living water can mean the difference between life and death to the people that you're talking to. Okay, so I had a conversation with a guy. I told Dora about it this morning. I just kind of slipped my mind, but I had a conversation with a guy in a store and uh, he was very hard and and very staunch uh, Christian, speaking from the terms of speaking in tongues and not having to follow the law. And uh, we got in a in a pretty good debate, and you know they're in the store. But you know I'm just hoping that something that I said maybe triggered his thought process to rethink where he really is. My last words to him were pretty harsh. I told him, I said, when, when the time comes or one of these days, you're going to be utterly devastated because you're going to figure out you're going the wrong direction. And when I told him that, it kind of, it kind of rocked him back a little bit, but he, you know, still just, you know, was very defiant in what I was trying to tell him. And so I hope that, I pray that something that I said will trigger something in his heart and life to get him back, to get him on the right track because he is way off base in, in things that he was saying. And so anyway, I know that, uh, you know, that, that, like I said, these springs of living water will flow from us when we have an opportunity to talk to people about Yahusha. And so uh, let's see, now we're in verse 40. On hearing these words, some of the people said, this is truly the prophet. Others declared, this is the Messiah. But still others asked, how can Messiah come from Galilee? Doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah must come from the line of David, from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? Now, we know that he was uh, born in Bethlehem. Scripture tells us that. And we know that he is a descendant of David. And see, okay, so one of the things that the, the, the Jewish Sanhedrin and those guys, they claimed and still do that Yahusha was illegitimate, that he was a bastard child, that he had, you know, that his, he was born out of wedlock. Well, so 
we know that that uh, he was born of the, the spirit and we know that, you know, his mother was, you know, she was a virgin when, when during the conception. And so we know where he actually was conceived or how he was conceived. He was conceived of the Ruach Kodesh. And so they claim that he is illegitimate. And so, you know, that's where, that's, that's a, the direction that a lot of this is coming from. That's because, you know, that's where they, they really, they, they didn't know, I guess, that he was born in Bethlehem. They didn't have the New Testament to read. Okay. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. So none of the people really, they, they probably didn't know that he was born in Bethlehem and they didn't, they didn't know his life because if, if we didn't have the New Testament, it would be hard for us to figure out a lot of this also. And so, you know, they just, you know, they were saying things that, that they really didn't know what they were talking about, but he was born in Bethlehem and he was a descendant of David. We know this because in, in the genealogies in Matthew, and then uh, I think it's in Mark, there's two genealogies. One is from Mary. The first one in Matthew is of Mary. And the second one is uh, of Joseph, Yahushua, the Yosef, his stepfather. But we know that he is a blood relative through Mary of, you know, he, uh, David had a son named Solomon, and then he's a descendant of Solomon through Mary, his mother. And uh, that's another study that will, you know, I've gone through some of it in the past before, but it's an interesting study. And, uh, but we'll have to redo it one of these days. It says, so there's division in the crowd because, Yahush because of Yahusha. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. When the officers returned to the chief priest and the Pharisees who asked him, why didn't you bring him? Uh, never has anyone spoken like this man, the officers answered. Have you also been deceived, replied the Pharisees. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law are under a curse. It's just so that this, that scripture, if you're not, if you're not following the Torah, then it, it's just like it says there that you are under the curse. They were under the curse because they weren't following the law either. They didn't realize that, you know, they didn't know who they were talking about in this particular case. Had they known the Torah, had they known the scripture, they would have seen that this, that, that he would have, that he was the Messiah. There were some that realized that he was the Messiah by, because they knew the scripture, they knew the Torah. But other than knowing, if you didn't know the Torah, the scripture, then you would not ever figure out that he was the Messiah. Nicodemus, who had gone to Yahushua earlier and who himself was one of them, asked, does your law convict a man without first hearing from him to determine what he has done? Aren't you also from Galilee? They replied, look into it and you will see that no prophet comes out of Galilee and each went his own way home. Well, he didn't actually come from Galilee. He lived, he may have been living in Galilee or staying in Galilee at the time, but he was born in, in Bethlehem. And so, uh, and here, there's something else here that, that I just kind of jumped out at me. When Nicodemus says, uh, who has gone to Yahushua earlier and who himself was one of them asked? One of them asked, okay, does your law convict a man without first hearing from him to determine what he has done? Okay, Nicodemus is asking the Pharisees, does your law, when he said your law, he's talking about the, the Talmud. He's not talking about the Torah. Okay, he knows that the Torah says that, uh, you know, you, that as far as convicting a man without first hearing from him, you have to hear testimony and he has to testify. And then also you have to have witnesses. Now he's asking, Nicodemus is asking the Pharisees, does your law talking about the Talmud? He's not talking about the Torah here. Well, maybe it is our. Okay, does okay, you're right, you're right. I I read that wrong. Does our law convict a man without okay? Well, he could be talking about either one because the Torah says, and also it's in the Talmud also. 
Now, the thing that, that, that in the Talmud is the actual law that the Pharisees will be looking at. Okay, so, you know, but, but the Torah does our law convict a man. That, you're right, okay, without first hearing from him to determine what he has done. Y'all keep me straight. All right. So the Torah and the Talmud, they're, they're, you're both going to say that a man cannot be convicted except on the testimony of two or three people. And he, he, is, he is given an opportunity to testify himself. Okay. So I'm going to cut it off right here. We've been, nah, it's not quite an hour. We're a little bit shy, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and cut it off right here. And uh, we'll continue on in uh, the book of John next Sabbath. So I thank all of you for watching. I thank all of you for being here this morning. And uh, I guess we'll see you next Shabbat, uh, Yahuwah willing. And hopefully before then, and we'll hopefully we'll be doing a, a study on uh, Sukkot here in a few days. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.